Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of May 27th, 2013. My name's Amal Matu, and welcome to the EKG video case for this week. First of all, I just want to send out uh, best wishes to everyone out there for a happy and safe Memorial Day weekend. I guess by the time you're listening to this, it may be past Memorial Day. But anyway, Memorial Day in the United States is the day that we honor all of those uh, men and women who fought in the um, in the military and gave their lives. And uh, this is actually a tradition that was started back in the Civil War. And it was expanded to uh, incorporate the memory of those who lost their lives in many other wars as well. So anyway, it's a very busy travel day also. And the unofficial beginning of summer and so uh, be careful out there on the road as well because there's, there's a lot of crazy people that drive these days. So anyway, uh, moving forward, let's talk about some 12 lead EKGs. All right, we're going to talk about interpretation. This, by the way, is my son. This was uh, back in 2004, so it's a little bit old, and uh, he's a lot bigger. And um, I, th I hope he's a lot better at reading EKGs. Well, probably not. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about a case that Dr. Brad Peckler sent. Dr. Peckler is an associate professor and the director of simulation at the University of South Florida. And he and his colleagues were taking care of an elderly male who had a history of dementia and came in with some malaise and weakness over the past three days. Some just quick vital signs. Blood pressure is not too bad. And we're going to assume that he wasn't in pulmonary edema or had any acute signs of instability. But he's got a pretty rotten heart rate, a heart rate of 28 so they got a quick 12 lead EKG on this guy, and he's got a fantastic rhythm. We haven't done rhythms in a while, so my thanks to Dr. Peckler for sending this because it gives us an opportunity to brush up a little bit more on some AV blocks, Brady dysrhythmias, and so on. So first of all, this is a really slow ventricular rate, and you'll notice that there are clearly P waves that are not being conducted, and I'm only circling the very obvious P waves, but you always wonder whether there's a P wave that's buried somewhere that you're not missing. So if, if you just go P wave to P wave to P wave, actually you get your calipers and these actually map out very nicely. So there are P waves that are buried within those T waves. And you can actually see just a little bit of a spike on, on these T waves as well. And that's a clue. Whenever you see pokey looking T waves, you always worry that there's a buried P wave. We've talked about that before. So anyway, what we're dealing with is some type of AV block that is producing three P waves for every one QRS complex. Now, whenever you have P waves that are not being conducted, you worry, is this MOBITS 1 or is it MOBITS 2 or is this AV dissociation with complete heart block? How do you figure out which of those three things is going on? Well, it's very simple. Whenever you're debating MOBIS 1, MOBIS 2, or AV dissociation, the answer lies in the PR interval. So just take a look at all of the PR intervals. There's one, there's one, there's one. And ask yourself, what are they doing? If it's MOBIS 1, the PR will be increasing before the drop. If it's MOBIS 2, the PR stays constant. And if it's AV dissociation or complete heart block, the PR will be randomly changing, increasing in some areas, then decreasing, and then really big and really small and just kind of all over the map. Well, if you just quickly take a look at this, you, I think it's pretty obvious that the PR interval on this 12 lead is staying constant. And so that makes it a MOBITS 2. Very simple. So braided dysrhythmias are really, really simple because the answer simply is in the PR interval. Now, there's a few other things that are going on on this 12 lead just to round out the interpretation. First of all, where are these P waves coming from? Are they coming from the sinus node or somewhere else in the atrium or in the junction or what's going on here? Well, I think we've talked before that sinus rhythm is defined by upright P waves in leads one, two, three, AVF, and inverted in AVR. So this meets the definition of sinus rhythm. So this is a sinus rhythm. And if you map these out, the rate is probably in the 80s to close to 90. And then we've already established that there's a MOBITS 2 with three to one conduction. And so the ventricular rate is one third of the rate 
of the atrium. So the atrial rate is around 90. The ventricular rate is around 30. We'll just make the math easy. You also notice the QRS is kind of wide, right? And when you've got a wide QRS, there's a differential that we've talked about before, but we're not going to spend too much time on that. There is a little r deep S wave in V1, V2, V3, and there's monophasic R waves in the lateral leads. In other words, there's no Q waves out there. And, and this would meet the definition of a left bundle. So this is, uh, just as an aside, this is a combination of a left bundle with a Mobitz 2. When you've got a left bundle with a Mobitz or a complete heart block, that's sometimes referred to as a trifascicular block. And the significance of using the term trifascicular block is simply it sounds cool. Uh, that's really all the significance is of that term. Some people like to use trifascicular block as the term. Um, and uh, this, this patient's at high risk of needing a permanent pacemaker unless there's some simple, simple solution. Now, one other thing that you might notice, and I have to be honest, I did not notice this initially. It took a little while before noticing this because I really just, I looked at this and I just focused on the rhythm, but is a nice reminder to me also, you've always got to look at the whole 12 lead EKG. What else is going on besides just the obvious abnormality there? And maybe you'll notice that these T waves are kind of big and they're just a little bit sharp at the top. Uh, these T waves aren't that tall, but they are a little bit sharp at the top. So you've got to concern yourself with the possibility of hyperkalemia. As we've said before, hyperkalemia is the great imitator or the syphilis of electrocardiography. So it's in the differential for everything. And we get some information on this patient. So again, there is the formal interpretation, sinus rhythm with a rate of 84, ventricular rates about 28, Mobus 2, and, and so on. We get some more information about this patient. And, and it sure enough, turned out the patient was mildly hyperkalemic, 6.9 normal being less than 5.5. The creatinine is elevated. Uh, normal is about, what normal is about one or so. And um, the, uh, the dish level is a bit elevated as well. And uh, so this patient in the presence of hyperkalemia and some renal failure, that dish level that is 1.9, normal being one to two, um, this is concerning. This is top normal, and this could be a reflection of chronic ditch toxicity. And uh, you've got to worry that maybe this um, ditch level is contributing to the, the, the rhythm here. Um, so what are you going to do? Well, Dr. Peckler and his colleagues went straight for giving digibind, which is perfect. And it turned out that when this patient got digibind, the rhythm went right back to normal. Patient was, a patient's rhythm was uh, in quandary was solved. The question oftentimes comes up and, oh, by the way, uh, the patient also did get some insulin albuterol and uh, furosemide for the hyperkalemia, but the digibine, I think, uh, fixed the patient pretty quick. The question comes up and people have emailed this, what about calcium? Would it be safe to give calcium to this patient who's hyperkalemic, who's on dig? Uh, maybe even if you know the patient's a bit dig toxic, is calcium safe? We've, I think we've all been taught that you never give calcium for hyperkalemia if there's a possibility that the patient's dig toxic. Because if you give calcium to these patients, it turns into what's referred to as a stone heart. Patients with dig toxicity are already intracellularly hypercalcemic. And if you give more calcium, they get even more hypercalcemic and that produces tetany, they cannot relax. So they get one really good systolic contraction and then they can't relax. So they end up dying in systole. It's kind of a, a strange thought, but it's a systolic death. The heart is contracted. People talk about that as being the stone feel of the heart. You're doing CPR and you feel this giant rock inside the chest because the heart cannot relax and the patient ends up dying with this so-called stone heart. Now, if you look at the literature, there's really not a lot to support this dogmatic belief that's been passed down through generations of physicians and written up in a lot of textbooks. More literature has been coming out over the past handful of years and people questioning whether that, uh, that uh, traditional teaching is true or not. And this is probably the best article that I've seen on this topic 
Now, there's not going to be any randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies. There's going to be a lot of case reports, and this is probably one of the best I've seen. This is published in Journal of Emergency Medicine just a couple of years ago. Levine and colleagues reviewed records from their teaching hospital over 17 years. They found 159 patients with digoxin toxicity, of whom 23 received calcium. And what happened to those 23 patients? Well, there is no increase in mortality and none of them developed any life-threatening dysrhythmias, V-fib or, or, or anything else. And so I think this is one more bit of evidence to say that the whole concept of calcium being contraindicated in ditch toxic patients is probably a myth, all right? So quick take-home points. Mobus 1 versus Mobus 2 versus AV dissociation, complete heart block. How do you tell the difference? Very, very simple. You simply need to look at the PR segments and you'll have your answer quickly. Secondly, remember once again, we over and over refer to hyperkalemia as the syphilis of electrocardiography because it is the great imitator. It can do anything, including these advanced AV blocks. And this was a very nice case of that that uh, Dr. Peckler sent. And finally, the literature seems to indicate that calcium is probably safe in ditch toxicity so if your patient is decompensating, this patient wasn't, so it probably wasn't an issue, but if the patient's decompensating uh, and you think there's hyperkalemia and maybe ditch on board, do not withhold calcium to treat that hyperkalemia just because they're on ditch or just because their ditch level is elevated. Use calcium to treat that hyperkalemia. Probably the best treatment is going to be your digibind, but digibind is, it doesn't uh, arrive in your ED really quickly and also it, I've read and heard that it takes at least half an hour to work anyway. So go ahead and give calcium uh, when necessary. It's the fastest thing you've got for hyperkalemia. All right. So uh, again, my thanks to Dr. Peckler and his colleagues for sending a really, really great case that gave us a chance to talk about hyperkalemia and ditch toxicity and uh, AV blocks. And uh, I hope that case was helpful. Remember, you've got to be the expert in electrocardiography. And one of the things you absolutely have to be the super expert in is hyperkalemia because it is the fastest and most common electrolyte killer in emergency medicine. You've got to know hyper-K inside and out. We talked about hyper-K last week. Please, please review that case as well. And we'll talk more about hyperkalemia in the coming weeks. But for now, hope you have a great weekend and I will talk to you next week.